Hi everyone, welcome to this new session of equity for CFA level 2. Today we will be going over the second reading in your equity curriculum which is talking about return concepts. Now this reading as a whole does not have a whole you know, new set of equations or new concepts to deal with. Rather it's mostly a repetition of what you've done at level 1. So in the entire curriculum of equity, the first three topics that you have, the first three readings, those are sort of introductory readings, fairly theoretical, trying to get you familiarized with a few concepts and help you recap some of the concepts from level 1. So there will be one or two new equations. We'll go over them as we go along. Let's start with the first topic for the day. The first topic that we have is talking about certain terminologies associated with the concept of return. Now, a lot of these terms you've already sort of covered somewhere or the other at level one. Here they are just given so that you have a context. A lot of these terms, we often use them interchangeably in place of one another, depending upon the situation. But they all have their different meanings and before we get into the detailed stuff of equity, it is very important to understand all of these meanings because they might often become distinguishing factor between you getting a right answer and the wrong answer. So let's look at the meaning of all of these. First one you have is the holding period return. Holding period return is a very basic simple concept. If an investor is holding on to a security for a certain amount of time, that time could be anything. It could be one day, it could be one month, it could be 10 years, anything. If the investor is holding on to an asset and uh, holding on to an asset or a security for a certain period of time, whatever total return he has in that certain duration, that is known as holding period return. So the formula goes something like this. It was P1 minus P0 plus cash flows divided by P0. Make it P T so that we have a surety that it is at any point of time you can have holding period return. This is not an annualized return. We never write percentage per annum behind it. It is for the holding period of the investor. So if I get this as 4% and the holding period was three months, it would be 4% return for three months. So just keep that in mind. We can also split this into two parts. So another way of writing it was something like this. Where I'm basically splitting the entire part into cash flows, which is basically my dividends interest. So this is my sort of cash yield. And this is the price difference any sort of capital appreciation that I've had. So this denotes capital gain or capital yield. So I hope holding period return is revised well. Then we have a few terms, realized return. Realized return is the actual return that an investor has. Now, if the situation is that we're talking about an investor who made an investment and then he sold after some time, holding period return and realized return would be same thing. The only difference is realized return is often annualized. Holding period return is not annualized. So if we are actually looking at the past data from actual facts and not expected returns or something like that, if we have actual data, the effective annual yield calculated using holding period return, that is known as realized return. So realized is just annualized in nature. That is the only sort of difference between realized return and holding period return. Aside from them, both of them are same concepts. If we are in fact talking about an investor who made an investment and got a return, we're not just talking, looking at a stock and saying that, okay, this stock had so much return over three months, that would be holding period return. But realized is when you have actually done a transaction on that particular security. Then we have expected return. Expected is something very subjective. It is going to vary from one investor to another. The basic idea is this is the amount of return that an investor is expecting from a particular stock. Next up, we have required return. Now, just like we had first and second being similar in certain situations, C and D, third and fourth, these would also be similar in certain situations. But before we cover those situations, Let's first discuss what exactly is the difference between these two. Expected is what I expect from a particular security, what I think it might have. 
required is what I want from the securities in which I am investing. So one is expecting, the other is wanting. That is the major difference between expected return and required return. Required return often could be looked at as a form of an opportunity cost that if let's say my money right now is sitting in a savings account earning 4%, if I am to divert that money and invest it into the equity shares, I want at least that 4% compensation plus something else because I'm taking risk. So when I actually want to make an investment, the return that I want, like the bare minimum to keep me satisfied, that is required return. So required return is a concept looking from the perspective of investor, whereas expected return is looking at the security specific that how much will that security probably increase or probably give us in terms of gains, whereas required is how much return does the investor need to keep him satisfied. So the perspective is changing, but both of them are looking at some sort of returns in the future. They are not a um, backward looking process, rather they are both forward looking, but the perspective is changed. One is from the investor's perspective, the other is from the security perspective. Then moving on to discount rates. Discount rate is any sort of rate that we use to bring back any sort of future cash flows into present value terms. Now, Discount rate is a term that is not, uh, you know, outright different from all of these. In fact, depending upon the situation, any of these could be used as a discount rate. So discount rate is just another term that had to be clarified. And lastly, similarly, on the same uh, you know, level of discount rate, you have IRR, internal rate of return. Just keep the basic definition in mind. IRR is the rate at which present value of all of my cash inflows is equal to present value of all cash outflows, which means I am in terms of cash flows, I am at a no gain, no loss situation. That is my internal rate of return. This is also the money weighted return. So just keep that in mind at level one, you must have covered two concepts, money weighted and time weighted. IRR is your money weighted return. So I hope all of that clarifies. There is one other concept specific to these two, which is price convergence. Let's quickly discuss that. Price convergence says that whenever we talk about any sort of intrinsic value, let's say, you know, the same case we took, I think the share price should be 100, it is currently 70. The situation is, that institute is giving an equation to you know connect expected return and required return and give us a difference between those two. The expected return is equal to required return plus price convergence. Price convergence is simply the difference between what the value should be. So value is something, you know, we calculated to be $100 for any particular stock minus what the price is divided by the price. Very similar to this concept. The only difference is instead of looking at price in the future and price right now, I'm looking at value right now and price right now. So think of undervalued stock. We do the same thing. We look at current value and then we compare it with the current price. Now the logic here is fairly simple. Required rate is something that the investor requires to keep him satisfied. Maybe when the investor is investing money, he's only looking for $10 of gain. So these are hypothetical numbers. The other sort of difference that is coming is from the idea. So this is known as price convergence. And this is based on just one assumption. So don't think that this is a 100% applicable in real world concept, rather it's based on one assumption. The assumption is that because the investment public in general is assumed to be rational, we believe that if there is any sort of difference between the intrinsic value and the price of any particular security, the same would be corrected in the market and the price will move towards the intrinsic value, primarily because investors are rational. So if there is some security which is undervalued, more and more investors would start exploiting that opportunity and as such the value would creep 
closer and closer to price. So let's say for security A, the expected return, the return that we actually expect to happen in the market, it would be a combination of required return of the investor and the simple act of its value and price slowly converging over time. So this equation again, uh, not necessarily relevant from practical calculation perspective, but it is just giving you context of expected return and required that at times expected is from the security perspective and required is from the investors perspective. Just keep that in mind. So that completes our first concept of return terminologies. Let's move on to the next one.